We're going to get started. My name is Lacey Nymeyer-John, and I am the Director of Alumni Career and Professional Development. And we are so excited for the first ever afternoon with Wildcat Women. And this is an event that we had been brainstorming for several months of how do we get together and celebrate some of the amazing women that we have in our alumni and campus communities. So um, thank you for being here, whether you are virtual or in person, we're happy to have you and excited for this event. We're going to have some great conversations. So before we get started with our panelists today, I'm actually going to get us uh, introduce our keynote speaker. And it is my privilege to introduce Carmen Bermudez. And before you come up, Carmen, I have a long introduction for you. Because <laughs> you have an amazing career and a wonderful Wildcat woman yourself. So Carmen Bermudez is the chairman and emerita and was the founder of Mission Management and Trust Company, established in 1994. Over the past three decades, Carmen has received many great honors, including, let me turn the page. All right, Woman of Enterprise for Avon Products in the Waldorf, Waldorf Astoria, New York City the leading women entrepreneurs of the world in Venice, Italy by the Star Group with underwriter IBM, sponsored by Fortune, Chase Manhattan Private Bank, and the Goldman Sachs. Also, Hispanic Woman of the Year by the Tucson Chamber of Commerce in Tucson, Arizona. Carmen has been featured in several publications, including the New York Times column, The Boss, Fortune Magazine's Minority Business Enterprise Special Industry Report, and Arizona's 48 Most Intriguing Women by the Arizona Historical Society. Carmen has served on several boards, including the Board of Trustees for Xavier University of Louisiana, and currently the University of Arizona Foundation Board of Trustees. She is a member of the Southern Arizona Leadership Council, and Carmen also serves as Honorary Consul of Costa Rica in the United States and an appointment conferred by the President of Costa Rica in 2002. So Carmen, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to pass the mic to you for a couple words. Thank you. I'm glad to be here with all of you here today. Thank you for the pleasure of your company. I'm on my fifth year on the Board of Trustees of University of Arizona um, here in Tucson. <laughs> I went blank. Um, on the University of Arizona Foundation. Okay. I started my association with the university when I, since day one. When I first came here to Tucson, I established my company, Mission Management and Trust, in 1994. This was the first women minority independent trust company in the country. I offered internships to students in Eller College, and some of them have gone to great careers. One of them is the first vice president of Goldman Sachs, and he makes a lot more money than I do. <laughs> I continue mentoring with uh, undergraduate students, some graduate students that are working on their PhDs, and some high school students. He's one of them. No high school. <laughs> um, they, um, we are a very small group uh, is called the powerhouse and we meet monthly when i was seven years old i was picking coffee in the fields of costa rica and i told my mother that i didn't want to be poor anymore so she said to me well what are you going to do about it I told her that I was going to be a bullfighter. She laughed, but I didn't. I was dead serious. I had no idea how I was going to do that. 
My father left my mother pregnant with her fourth child and I was two years old. My mother became my first mentor because I saw the courage she had to raise four children without the help of my father. My mother brought me to the United States when I was 15 years old. We work in all kinds of jobs, cleaning houses, hotel rooms, assembly jobs, any job we can get for seven days a week until we got enough money to send out for my siblings to come to California. Once my brothers and sister arrived in the United States, I was able to go to high school. And there I heard of this man from Spain who was teaching bullfighting to Hollywood actors. So he gave me free lessons. And off I went to Mexico City to fulfill my dream, a place that I had never been and I had not known anyone in there. So I lived in a hotel, found a job during the week in an office, and on the weekends, I fought bulls. Since back then, there were no women bullfighters, I became a celebrity. I had a lifestyle that I never had before, except there was one problem. While I was partying, drinking tequila until 2 a.m., the bull was resting, waiting for me. I started to get hurt, so it was time to move on. So I decided to come back to California. And now I wanted to see the world, except I didn't have any money. What better way to see the world than to join the airlines, huh? So I applied for every single airline that I could find. And for a year and a half, it was all I heard was no. I didn't give up hope. I came across this lady interviewing that saw something in me. And she corrected my application and had me rewrite it. And with her recommendation, I was uh, hired by TWA. That was amazing. I was ready to fly. What better way than to work your way there? Now, I could have worked for free. It was so much fun. I met my husband in disguise, and off I embarked to a great life. When I retired, from TWA after 18 years, I was 44 years old, and I decided to become a triathlete. I worked so hard that for the first two years, I was eighth and 10th in the country. I finished that path with a big splash I entered the Escape from Alcatraz in San Francisco. That event consists of a mile and a half swim from the island of Alcatraz to the aquatic, bar, aquatic park, a seven mile run to the Golden Gate Bridge and back. And guess what? I finished first in my age group. And so I gotta make sure this is age group. 
from someone who has experienced good times and bad times, I have to offer some things that help me. Um, don't be afraid to pursue your dreams. Even if others try to discourage you, like my mother did. She didn't want me to be a bullfighter. Don't let no stop you from achieving what you want. Find mentors, men or women. And if you're fortunate enough to reach the penthouse with whatever you do, be a mentor. And don't forget to send the elevator back down. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. All right, I think I can put this mic down. And I have a mic right here. Oh yeah, Carmen, get stay hydrated, as every great athlete knows. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Carmen, for sharing your story with us and being a part of this event today. Um, we are really excited for the next conversation. And before we get to the panelists, we are here in the Arizona Bookstore, so I do just have to give a shout out to the Arizona Bookstore for providing this space for us and also providing this beautiful display over here of books that actually our panelists recommended for all the aspiring leaders in uh, online and in the house today. So be sure to pick up your book recommend, recommended by our Wildcat women. And also don't forget to grab some Arizona swag, right? We'll all be getting some coupons. You can get your U of A gear. Make sure you look good at the next sporting event that you attend um, or any other Arizona event. So uh, we are going to have our panelists come up in just a second. And we are going to have a panel of Wildcat women entrepreneurs. So I'm going to invite the panelists up. We're going to take a seat and get to the conversation. So come on up, panelists. All right, we're going to get nice and cozy here <laughs> on the chairs, yes. Um, and I have my script here. But we are going to introduce each of these women, and they are phenomenal. So first up is going to be Yvette Marie Margallon. And she is a wildcat. She's actually also the founder and CEO of ABA Consulting Group for Autism Pediatrics as well as the Tucson Tea Company. So her company, Autism Pediatrics, is a private medical practice specializing in therapy for children with autism and other developmental disorders and educational consulting for the families across the US and abroad. In January 2021, Yvette Marie and her husband, Eddie Diaz, founded Tucson Tea Company, a loose leaf micro blend tea company focused on promoting health and wellness and building partnerships that promote economic development among Arizona growers and artisans. Tucson Tea quickly rose to prominence, winning multiple awards and establishing partnerships with some of the Tucson's most renowned businesses. Currently, Yvette Marie serves on boards of the Girl Scouts of Southern Arizona and the El Rio Foundation, and is an advocate of STEM entrepreneurship, early childhood education, and financial literacy. Yvette Marie was recently elected as curator for the Global Shapers of Tucson Hub, born out of the World Economic Forum. The Global Shapers community is a network of inspiring young adults under 30 working to address local, regional, and global challenges under the direction of global leaders. Both Yvette Marie and her husband, Eddie, are LRMIS alums. So thanks so much for being here, Yvette. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah. All right, next up is Bonnie Johnson. Bonnie Johnson is a registered dietitian for more than 20 years of experience in the food industry. She calls herself a nutrition translator, working to translate and deliver credible science-based information to business partners 
healthcare professionals, and consumers to build trust, respect, and reliability with consumers. Over the past 10 years, she has partnered with a number of startup ventures to bring natural food products to life. Her biggest success was being part of a team that launched the A2 Milk Company in the US, bringing easier to digest milk to the market. This launch was created a new category in the milk case, and the A2 Milk brand is by far the leader in the category. Currently, she is working with a startup in stealth mode, striving to bring precision nutrition to the masses through proprietary software and prepared meals. Bonnie graduated from the University of Arizona in 1994 with a BS in nutrition. However, <laughs> she considers that her time spent as an Arizona ambassador and a Bobcat, yes, <laughs> among others, to be even more valuable than her degree, right? Those experiences. She lives with her, I love this. She lives with a family of buffaloes, <laughs> grads from the part. University of Colorado, <laughs> or Colorado University, and spends her free time watching college sports in the kitchen with her kids or on the golf course with her husband. Mm -hmm. All right, Bonnie, thanks so much Thank for you. joining us. And last but not least, we have Liz Pocock. Liz is the CEO of Startup Tucson and the 10 West Impact Festival and has over 10 years of experience in economic development and building community and nonprofit organizational management. As CEO, Liz has helped lead Startup Tucson in serving over 2,500 2, entrepreneurs a year and grown the 10 West Impact Festival to over 14,000 attendees in 2019. Liz is licensed in Arizona and received her JD from the University of Arizona College of Law and is an adjunct lecturer of leadership and innovation within the Department of Agriculture, Education, Technology, and Innovation. The College of Agriculture and Life Sciences has also been, has her as an adjunct professor for entrepreneurship for their business school. Liz is busy. <laughs> but prior to Startup Tucson, Liz was supervising a research attorney and a development director for the National Law Center, where she implemented international legal commercial reform and training projects for the State Department and World Bank. She is also a trained mediator, a Google woman tech maker, and a member of the CBDC and Pima, County, Pima Community College Business Advisory Group, as well as a commercialization partner for Tech Launch Arizona. In addition, <laughs> I know, Liz um, is a Tucson 40 Under 40 recipient in 2019 and was the 2020 Tucson Woman of Influence Rising Star Award winner. So uh, Liz and her husband have called Tucson home for over 10 years and recently welcomed their first daughter in 2021. So She's we, a wildcat. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Pick up some Arizona swag today. Uh, so we have an amazing panel. Let's give them a round of applause before we get into the questions. All right. So we are so grateful for you to spend your time to share some of your expertise with us today. And I think each of you come from a unique sector of industry and unique experiences that can help our audience, whether we are entrepreneurs ourselves or have an entrepreneurial spirit, right? Um, I think anyone can benefit from this conversation. So I have a few questions prepared that we will get to in a second. But if you have questions, we will have a Q&A section at the end, and we'll take questions from our online audience as well as our in-person audience. So all right, let's get to the questions. You all have so many inspiring careers and have done so much. So can you tell us a little bit about what is the journey to get to the points that you are at in your career, right? Um, Bonnie, do you maybe want to start us off with this? Uh, probably the best one to start it off because it was so unique. When you hear registered <laughs> dietitian, you think that I should be um, probably working in a hospital or giving out diet um, advice somewhere, which is exactly the opposite of what I do. And part of the way I got into what I did is taking a bit of a risk and stepping outside of the traditional role of a dietitian and going to work in the food industry to help with innovation and renovation of products in order to make, what I say, make the healthy choice the easy choice. So um, starting with some commodity groups, working with them to make sure that their marketing messages were getting to the right audiences 
and then even up to working with Quaker, everybody eats oatmeal, um, working with Quaker on how could they improve the um, healthfulness of their portfolio by mainly sugar reduction, um, to now working with startups that are really trying to bring these natural products to life, but it does take a little bit of a science background to make sure that you're not making claims that aren't substantiated. So taking a risk is really the big step. Yeah, what great advice, right? Liz, you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, so also non-traditional <laughs> pathway. Um, I went to law school here, um, and out of law school, worked at the National Law Center. I was doing international economic development. It was really fun. I was traveling a ton, but it was really um, macro. So we would help countries uh, reform their uh, lending laws, um, access to credit laws. It eventually helped small businesses and entrepreneurs, but we wouldn't see those effects for three or four years. In the meantime, my husband, also a U of A alum, Perfect. and I were falling more and more in love with Tucson, and I was realizing I was trying to get the law center that did international stuff to do something local. Uh, Start of Tucson, in the meantime, was a grassroots organization that was getting started here in town to help entrepreneurs and small businesses launch and grow, um, and they kind of out of nowhere asked if I would come join their team and it was the right fit at the right time. And I started as the COO and then have taken over as the CEO for the last five years. Um, and so Startup Tucson gets to help entrepreneurs um, build their businesses every day and it's an amazing experience. I don't practice law now, it's not, <laughs> but, but I use my law degree every day and get to interact with the university regularly and tons of entrepreneurs like that, it's amazing. So. Yeah, it's wonderful. I love the theme here of just kind of like taking opportunities even when you don't know exactly what's gonna, what's gonna end up. Perfect. All right, Yvette, do you have any other thoughts? So my career path is, I'm guessing, it's gonna seem a little more traditional, I wanna say. So I, um, my very first job was when I was 17, like my first big girl job, right? I always did obviously little, little side hustles throughout life. But at 17, I was finally on the payroll. I was too young to work under the DES contract, um, working with children with autism. So I was a tutor working privately. And then once I turned 18, I was moved immediately into a managerial role. So I was really fortunate that I was that young to be able to manage, I think it was like 30 people at the, at the time. And I knew I really liked what I was doing, but I wasn't so much interested in studying psychology. So I thought, okay, what can I study that will still allow me to be in this sort of industry. And having the number one MIS program in my backyard, I thought I have to do that. You know, I, I like engineering, but it was a little less um, extroverted than I normally would like. So I decided to study MIS and I did my undergrad and my master's in MIS here. And just spent as much time as I could acquiring as much business acumen as I could. So I did an internship on Wall Street. When I came back, I got recruited to NASA. You never say no to NASA. I had no idea what I was going to do, but I thought I'm going to learn something here that's going to help me in my business. And um, eventually, I, um, when I started my master's in MIS, I also started a master's in applied behavior analysis. So I don't recommend doing two at a time. I did that. I wouldn't <laughs> recommend it. But, um, but it was what I needed to do at the time. So I just kind of would not say no to any opportunity that would help me develop business acumen. Then I did my clinical work, learned as much as I could about you know the operations of the healthcare end, and then once I finished everything, then I took the plunge to start my company. But they they really say you know you have to be all in to start a business. So I made sure that I was completely all in and I had all the skin in the game. Yeah, yeah. And again, you know, taking those steps, it it, it takes risk. It takes you know that confidence and that courage, right, to go all in, like you said. Um, great, I love that. So when we were reading your bios, where I was reading your bios, you all were listening to these amazing women and how busy they are navigating family and life and volunteer and well as your normal job. Um, what does balance mean to you and how do you find balance in your day-to-day -day balancing so many things at one time? So Liz, do you want me to start with that? Um, yeah, sure. I think that's something people are talking about a lot right now, right? With yeah. After the pandemic, we kind of refound different types of balance or maybe we didn't during COVID and now we're trying to figure out what is the new normal or reimagine what the new normal is after all of this. Um, I have a really amazing team. So my team helps me find balance and we help each other find balance. We try really hard to check each other on 
you know, we're going to have sprints in our business. Every business is going to have sprints where you're going to have times where you're, you know, are working extra hours and putting in extra time. But after you do those sprints, you need to have times where you rest and recharge and recuperate. And I think um, we've tried to create a company culture that really responds to that. Um, and I think that probably comes from being in prior jobs or positions that didn't value that balance. And so now that I've had the opportunity to create a culture at an organization, trying to make sure that everyone knows that's where we're coming from. Our team also happens to be all women. So it's not, not necessarily intentional. I am very happy with that outcome, but it's not like that's what we're intending to do. Um, but we are all women, and so I think it, it because we're in a team of women, we can respond to each other and respond to each other's needs. Um, I didn't really know how I was going to – I had my, my little girl – during COVID, so she was a COVID baby, um, and I didn't know what it was going to be like. Startup Tucson is, a, we do a ton of events for entrepreneurs. We do stuff like this all the time. We do evening things. We do early morning things. We do weekend things. That was what it looked like before COVID, and so moving after having uh, Lilia and kind of coming back to work, I wasn't sure how that was going to work, but it's my team that's been really mindful of like, you can't, no, not more than two nights a week because we know you want to be home with her and we'll make sure to schedule that later and we kind of check each other, which I think is really great. So surrounding yourself with people that understand what your work-life balance, what work-life balance you are striving for and then help you get there. Hold you accountable. Hold you to accountable work, to, to it work as life well. Balance. Yeah. I love that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yvette, do you want to add to that? That's a million dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it, it's really difficult for me to think of, you know, what what can I recommend as a self-care strategy when it's something that I try to prioritize and it's very difficult when you're constantly firing on all cylinders. And so I was actually just telling um, these wonderful ladies about how I just kind of want to disappear for a month. And I think that's going to be kind of part of my self-care is normally I, I set these really lofty goals. And once I hit that goal, I have a tendency to not celebrate. So I need to be better about practicing what I preach because I tell everyone, you know, celebrate all of your little wins because they give you momentum. When you get momentum, then you start going after the bigger goals. But I mean, I drink a lot of tea. That helps a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it helps relax you. Yeah. But, um, but really, uh, self-care is something that's super individual to everyone. And um, for example, someone might tell me, oh, you know, just take, a, take some time off and go have dinner. But that might stress me out more, right? Because I need to, you know, check off a few things, right? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or you're like, if leaving these to-dos might not necessarily yeah. help me. It might give me a little more stress. So I've become really self-aware of, you know, I, I need to give myself the, the allowance, right? Of, okay, I'm going to do three more things, and then I'm going to go have dinner. I'm going to spend time with my husband, see my friends. Um, one of the things that's really helped me recently is I have this group of friends where without fail we meet every week right at least once because they're all entrepreneurs and we all have to you know see each other encourage each other and then just relax and have a cup of coffee have some dinner so it's it's really important to build self-care into your everyday habits yeah i love that even just setting a schedule for it and yes. scheduling it just like you, you would put schedule. it on your calendar yeah i yeah. love that that's great advice mm -hmm. fine I haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm older than everybody on the panel. So um, I think the key from, from both sides here is some accountability and people around you to make sure that you are celebrating those wins and giving yourself some grace. So I'm really lucky to have a husband who supports all of my cockamamie ideas and he's also a little bit uh, on the devil's advocate side of making sure that once they get a little bit out of control that maybe we rein them back in. So <laughs> I think that people around you is really important to make sure that 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 you're taking those times and that you're balancing um, what you're doing and and that you like what you're doing. The minute that there is something in my life that I'm not enjoying anymore, it's time to get out of it. Yeah, what great advice. Mm -hmm. and, and I love the common theme of you know, having those people around you, your support base that help you recharge, however that is, right? That's so great. All right, next question. Yvette, this one's coming to you. You're going to kick us off here. Um, what are some of the barriers and challenges that you have faced along your career journey? And maybe some tips and strategies that you've used to overcome those. Oh, barriers. 
I think sometimes you are your biggest barrier. We, we tend to, as, as entrepreneurs, as business owners, we tend to get in our own way. And uh, one of the things that one of my mentors taught me is most small businesses don't break the 40 employee mark because the CEO tends to wear every hat. And I, I took that to heart immediately and I said, you know, I want to I wanna break the, the 40 employee mark. And that happened once I started delegating. And so it, it's, it's really strange, but you, you tend to be your own, your own obstacle many times. So the, the first thing that I recommend to everyone is, let's say for example, if you value your time at $50 or $100, and you do whatever, right, X, Y, Z, you have your skill, but a bookkeeper will cost you $30 an hour, and they're professional, right? If you do it yourself, it's gonna be you know, very, just not great. Always hire a professional, right? Outsource everything you possibly can. And so that's something that I learned really early on. And I kind of knew in the back of my head, like I should be delegating, I should be outsourcing, but I wouldn't do it. And so the first year in operation, we had 15 employees and I thought, okay, how are we gonna break the 15 employee mark? How are we gonna break, you know, all of these goals that we're setting? And that was, that was really it. That was, that was a big barrier is just kind of letting go and not trying to, I'm not a micromanager, but I always assume like, well, if I can do it right, I might as well just do it myself. That's, that's kind of a, a, a big thing that you should avoid. So I definitely say that. And other barriers, I think around the time that I was graduating college, I mean, the, we had the crisis in 2008, right? And so I started college in 2009. So I had a very, um, a very big scarcity mindset because money dried up. And so it was like, well, how am I gonna pay for my college? How am I gonna do this? How am I gonna start a business? So um, one of the things that I made sure to do every time um, I got a tax refund, I would withdraw the money and I would put it in, a, in an actual uh, safe at the bank. And so a few years later, I had money to start a business. And so I, I just had to be you know, very careful, very on top of you know, what are my budgets and everything. So right now we're in kind of a weird economy and there's a lot of people who I talk to who wanna start businesses and that's kind of the lingering worry is you know what's going on with the economy what are we going to do and so that's that's one thing that i really recommend is always getting your your finances in order so that that is not a barrier to starting your business yeah i love that you know being able to map that out ahead of time right and, and really prepare for when like you said earlier take that leap and go all in and have the funds in order to do that perfect liz bonnie i can, yeah, I can go um mm -hmm. So you got, you got hit on some really great stuff, but um, I think some barriers uh, early on in my career in both positions I had uh, were both heavily male-dominated spaces. So law is heavily male-dominated, as well as uh, startups and entrepreneurship. Um, both of those offices, when I walked in, I was usually one of the only women. And I think that can be, you kind of get in your head about that, and that can be a very intimidating space. Um, and that you kind of develop your own sense of imposter syndrome. Um, and so those were, I think, were things that I had to kind of overcome to say, you know, they just started this two years before I did. It's not like they know that much more than me. I could, you know, brush up on this and enter a new, especially if you're going to do lateral transitions in your career or start in a new industry like a lot of entrepreneurs, right? You come in with a passion or maybe you're an inventor or a maker and you know one side of it and you might not know the business side of it just because you don't know it right then doesn't mean you can't know it. And I think that that's something that was a really important lesson for me to learn was that I wasn't ever an expert at what I started right away. But then when you get into it and you kind of start to fall in love with different pieces of it and you love the learning side of it, you can become an expert and then you know more than that person in the room that's sitting next to you. Um, and not being afraid to kind of challenge some of that. So I think we've seen a lot of that in in the Tucson entrepreneurship ecosystem uh, more recently was very male dominated at the, a number of years ago. And now you're seeing way more women in different positions, way more women launching companies. Um, and we you know we serve in our entrepreneurs, we serve 60% female founders of our total amount, which is just incredible. And you see women finding other women and building each other up and helping each other with those challenges. And so I think, you know, finding people that can relate to you and your issues. I think I had the breakthrough when I talked to a colleague and said like, I just don't know, I might not, might not like wanna stay here. This is just 
like, I don't love coming to work right now. I'm not, I don't feel like I get it. And they're like, why don't you get it? You would get it if you just did what you did in the last position you were in. And having like somebody say like, they don't know any more than you. <laughs> they just have been doing it two months longer than you. Like, okay, okay. So I think, you know, finding those people that can help you kind of take that next step. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I mean, just like what Yvette was saying, right? Get out of your own way. Get out of and, your own way. And mm -hmm. be vulnerable, and it's okay not to have all the answers mm -hmm. at that moment. We can delegate, we can find mentors. Oh, that's perfect. Bonnie, what do you have to add? This one's really timely for me right now as I am kind of looking at a bit of a career change and realizing that while I love what I do as a nutrition translator, really sitting between marketing and R&D, what I'd really like to do is move forward with developing and driving strategy for these groups in order to maybe speed up the process of some of this portfolio and product renovation um, to make healthy choices. So um, to me, some of it's about looking for the education. Mm -hmm. um, what do you need to move um, to that next step? And for me, while I do have the background of working with the business side of these industries, um, I don't have the piece of paper. I don't have the, I don't have what everybody's looking for in terms of the letters behind my name. And so um, I took a leap a couple of weeks ago and put my name in the hat for the executive MBA program here. Oh. <laughs> so a scientist and MBA is kind of a bit of a unicorn. So yes. that's, a, you know, you take a risk and you move forward, hopefully. Yeah, absolutely. You notice none of us are MBAs. I know. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Mm -hmm. Yet. Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you. And, you know, I think that's something to to also, you know, just the courage and the confidence that you ladies are, are talking about. You know, is that something that was that you had to, you know, work on? Or have you always kind of just been that, bullfighting mentality like <laughs> Carmen here, right? And where did that come from in, in each of you? I know I'm going off script here. I like to consider it ignorance on fire. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what you're doing, but you want to do it, and you just do it. And so it's, uh, it's pretty powerful when you don't know what you don't know because you're just a sponge and you start absorbing everything. And if you see other people and you're like, well, if they can do it, I can do it. Why not? Yeah. So it's, it's because um, I mean, I had these thoughts when I was 17. Yeah. And that's pretty just wild of a 17 year old to be like, oh yeah, I can do that. And, and I think back on it and I'm like, that was kind of arrogant of me to be like, I can do that. <laughs> but, but the reality is you can. It's just yeah. that sometimes for whatever reason, we're kind of culturally conditioned into like, oh no, there's, there's these steps. And that, that's kind of one of the big things I've noticed is we, we tend to, like we as a society are indoctrinated into thinking that everything is a step. Like it's a step one, you take your first step. Why not just a progression, right? Why not just a linear progression? And mm -hmm. and um, so that's why I encourage everyone, you know, if you, it, you don't necessarily need to know what you're doing, you can learn along the way. Yeah, it's helpful to know a few things mm -hmm. before you start, but um, really attitude is, is huge. Mm -hmm. I love that. Where does your it factor come from, Well, Liz? I think I think that, um, so my, I had always really strong role models, right? So the way that Carmen was talking about her mom, my grandmother um, didn't finish high school, and my her and my grandfather bought farmland out in Holly Valley and built one of the first ranches in that area. And my grandma, you know, got her GED, managed the books for the ranch, opened a post office, ran a liquor store and gas station. <laughs> my mom followed behind her, and my parents owned two local pharmacies. So. I've been raised by small business owners that just kind of did it and strong female role models that just kind of did it. And it was never a question in our household of like, if you were going to, it was just what you were going to. And so I think that to, you know, bullheaded confidence, you just kind of like keep going and somebody tells you no, you say why, and then you keep going further. And I think that's probably where it came from. I love it. And I'd have to say that my experience here at yeah. U of A was really what gave me, um, not gave me the courage, but developed my leadership. Um, call a, a high school athlete that decided not to play in college, but I also came here from out of state and didn't know a soul on campus. 
Um, and everybody's advice was get involved, and so I did. I got involved in everything, not just for the free pizza, but <laughs> to, to learn something, um, to learn something, and to and to grow that leadership skills. Um, I'm in a I'm in a very different uh, profession where 97% is female. Um, and you know we don't work all that well together. Mm. You know we kind of we kind of are competitive amongst each other. That's why I have this wolf pack book up here because mm -hmm. um, it's so important for women in business. Um, but it, but working with different people and getting to know different sides of uh, di different opinions and keeping an open mind and learning different strategies. I think that that really grew me into who I am today, even more so than my degree helped. That was subject matter. The rest was from campus involvement. Yeah, I love that, and just getting exposed mm -hmm. to different people, and and like you said, those role models and mentors. So let's keep on this leadership theme. I like where this is going. Um, so being a leader in your business, you've had to adjust your leadership styles, right? Depending on your employees, depending on your the target audiences that you work with, and so depending on you know where you're at. How do you lead your team successfully? So, Liz, do you want to start us off? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, we, uh, again, I try to think of what I was craving in a leader when I was early in my career. I have a lot of, um, I have a really young team. Everyone's excited, really passionate, um, and that's how I was right out of law school. And I try to create an environment where our team um, can contribute their ideas, can start new projects. Um, we follow the same things that we teach our startups. So we use lean experimentation and customer discovery. And so I'll say, hey, you, like, you know, our team will be out in the community and they'll say, I really think you need to do a program that's specifically for makers. And it's going to do this thing because I've seen 10 makers come in and they're struggling all with the same problem and we got to have a class mm -hmm. on that. And instead of saying like, no, I'm not sure if we have the resources, I'll say, how many customers did you talk to? What were their specific pain points? Do, how do we think we're going to solve it? Let's run a micro experiment and try to get a workshop off the ground. What do we think that we are going to accomplish with that? And afterwards, we assess how it went and if we're going to do it again. And so I think giving our team and empowering them to create um, and bring their ideas to the table has made our team has allowed our team to be as collaborative as it is. So I try to lead from a collaborative um, kind of perspective. Yeah, and creating an environment where even if it's not a great idea, if there's failure, right? Like, yeah. We fail together. We fail all the time. Yes. So we have so many ideas that we think are going to be like the best thing, and then we run them, and we're like, that did not work at all the way we thought it was going to. Okay, what didn't work about it? How are we going to bring that into the next program? And then we, you know, try again. What's the saying? You miss every shot you don't exactly. take, right? Exactly. Perfect. And you slow yourself down. I think that, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the nonprofit space, that a lot of nonprofits get so caught up in building the perfect program that they don't build any program or they take so long to build a program or they spend so much money on building a program that it just ends up they're not actually serving who they want to serve as much as they'd like to and that's why a lot of nonprofits have gotten this kind of bad rep for a while and I think if you can kind of approach things with this lean methodology you can move really fast and discover what works really well and scale those things and cut what doesn't and everybody's happy because you're working on exciting fun things. I love that. I love in, that. In our house we say progress over perfection. Yes. 100%. <laughs> and it works with business and parenting. Uh -huh. Okay, that's good to know. Good advice. Yeah, yeah. Bonnie, do you have any advice on leadership is, um, with that comment? You know, to me, and we were talking about this earlier too, when I have managed a team, my goal as a leader is to make the people on my team more successful than me. So I want to make sure that I can bring them along and that they can work in a situation that is at my level or above. Um, and that's where I feel success. It's not a competitive thing with me. It's actually building, some, building up my team so that they have the confidence and they have the skills that they need to move along and um, go farther in their careers. Um, I also think transparency and candor are really, really important. You can't be... I mean, as much as I love cheerleading, you can't be positive all the time. There are things that go wrong, and you, you have, have to, to you have to address. And you can't run around and just think everything is you know butterflies and rainbows. You really have to make sure that you're addressing the things that are 
pain points or they are failures and and learn from them and move forward um, but you know the minute that you sit in your back in, in the back office and say oh everybody's doing fine I'm just gonna ignore that one two three things you're you're setting everybody up for failure yep, yep. I love that accountability and being able to express that in a way where you still have the the culture and, and the trust of your team teammates what Yvette so one of the things that I really focus on, and it's actually part of the science of behavior analysis, it's individualization. So it takes a little more time, right? But once you individualize everyone's needs, everyone's goals, it's uh, just kind of one of the biggest things that I'm proud of. In, in the healthcare industry, turnover is really, really high, right? You have, especially in behavioral health and developmental disabilities, it's on average about six months. And I started my business five years ago and I was going over like payroll like pay stubs from like sending the, the WGs out in the mail and I was like wow I've had you know all of these people were have been here since the beginning they've been here for you know five years four years like whenever it was that they started and one of the things that I think big companies need to really focus on I think smaller companies were better at this because we connect a lot more with with them our teams but there's always those managers that they they send you like a, a survey, right? Of, you know, what, what do you want? I, I wanna know exactly what you want. And they, you go through this whole thing and you tell them exactly what your needs are. And then they're like, you spoke, we listened. And it's like the exact opposite of what yes. you said. <laughs> and you're just Violet. like, why even? And so I see this a lot with bigger companies because mm -hmm. the reality is, you know, you might have a grandparent who wants to take time off to go to their child's little league game. You might have a new mom who wants to take time off um, to spend time with the baby, or you might have, you know, people who want to travel. You might have people who are incentivized by money because they have student loans. We're all motivated by different things, and so it's really important to know what everyone is motivated by, because a one size fits all approach is never going to work. Like the the cookie cutter formula, it, it's dead. And um, the biggest thing that we've found success in is automatic feedback. So we'll have we'll go through like coaching sessions with our staff and we see what they're struggling with in the moment and how can we help and how can we fix it and do we need to do retraining or was the training not good to begin with you know how how can we improve these things because a lot of companies will do like the the annual review <laughs> why like just, why even do that if, if you have a problem right now you're going to wait 12 months from now to address it that's just you know planning to fail so it's really important to do everything in the moment and to really actually keep everyone's needs um, in mind and getting to know your employees is kind of what I'm hearing too, right? And you know them, you build a relationship with them. It's perfect. Wonderful. All right, I have one more question for you, and then we're going to open it up to the audience for, for additional questions. Um, what advice would you ladies have for either current entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs um, moving forward? What would be one piece of advice that, that you would give them? Bonnie, do you want to maybe start? I, I think Liz already hit on it a little bit. And having worked for so many different food startups at this point, surround yourself with the right people. You don't yeah. have to know everything. You just have to know the people who know what you don't. And surround yourself with those people, to, and that will be successful. The minute that you think that you know everything about your business is the minute that you fail. Mm. I think I included this as my, you asked for like a quote, your favorite quote. Yeah. I think somebody told me one time, don't take criticism from anyone you wouldn't take advice from. Yeah. And I think Ooh. some of what we've talked about on, about, you know, we're our, our harshest critics, but also there's a lot of people that will tell you you're not going to succeed. And they'll say that, oh, you know, that idea is stupid, or you don't know what you're doing, you don't have enough experience, or that would never work. And I always kind of say like, yeah, but if somebody had pitched me Twitter, there is no way I would have said that that was a good idea. <laughs> but that was a great idea, like, you know, you don't know. And so um, we, at Startup Tucson, try to take the approach that, you know, it's not our job to say whether your idea is great or not. It's like, it's your idea. We're gonna help you support it in whatever way, and I think just, Finding people that will help you in that same way, um, because you know there's, there's a lot of naysayers out there. So just move on from them and surround yourself with people that believe in you. Mm -hmm. Yep, your people. Mm -hmm. Right. Go ahead, Yvette. I think it was Michael Jordan who said, "Failure to plan is planning for failure," 
And I can't emphasize enough the importance of a business plan. As much as people think that it's not important, they think it's just like some random document, I review my business plan so often. Like there was a time where I think like a year went by in my healthcare company with autism pediatrics where I hadn't looked at it. And then I was like, okay, I wanna go see iteration number one, like back when I started. And then I started leafing through it. And I was like, oh, that's so cute. Like all the things that I wanted to do, right? And so just reaching goals. I think there's a just public happening. safety alert wow. that we're getting. Phoenix public, public safety Sorry, alert. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> At least we're all getting the alert. Yeah. <laughs> we're all kind of in a bunker already. So. <laughs> it's, it's, it's Phoenix. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But um, but I can't overemphasize the importance of having a business plan and also kind of what, what Bonnie and, and Liz were saying. Don't take advice from people who won't live with the consequences of your yeah. actions, right? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people are really good at just talking, right? They talk, mm -hmm. talk, talk, they say everything. They're not necessarily positive. And it's really important to not let that get in your head. Because when I started my company, everyone was like, what are you doing? Like, you're throwing away a, a successful career. And I was able to replace my successful career within less than a year. And then when I started Tucson Tea, people thought I was insane. They were like, you're throwing away a successful business. I was like, I can have two. Like, <laughs> there are so many people that have multiple businesses. And now people are like, oh, it's going so well. This is awesome. And I'm like, these are the people who were literally saying, like, you're crazy, are now on the bandwagon, right? So it's really important to just know that you have to really listen to yourself and to your intuitions because gut feelings are usually research that you have stored in the back of your head it's not just like a random little thought mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i love that right and mm -hmm. and taking that step and being confident and believing in yourself and having that vision I love it. all right everyone this is your moment we do have a microphone so if you have a question um you can go ahead and answer it there were some questions submitted online, so I'm going to look at the audience here if there's any hands that come up. Oh, no. All right, we got one. Tag. Yes. Oh, great. We'll take a question from our live our live audience in-house, in and then we'll take a question from our online audience. And if it's okay, I'd like to pull in Carmen, because this is for you all. So oh, um, I'd like to have, have all of you comment on luck versus opportunity. Um, Carmen coming from Costa Rica and poor, uh, didn't have a whole lot of opportunity, but did you? And what kind of luck have you all had? Um, and what do you think about the, the tie between luck versus opportunity? Perfect. Well, we get the mic up here to Carmen. Maybe we'll start with our panelists to tackle that. I think you have to start. I think I have to start. That's my husband. So. <laughs> um. <laughs> Planted question. The, uh -huh. That was not a planted question because I wish you would have uh, brought that up earlier. Um, <laughs> and, but we do have this conversation a lot. And I think, to me at least, there's some luck in finding the opportunities. But we've all, we all said at the beginning, a lot of this is taking the opportunities when they are handed to you and seeing them as opportunities because sometimes they look like obstacles and challenges. Yes. But they are actually opportunities. And so recognizing that they're there. Um, of course, there's some luck involved in some of this stuff, but um, that's for the conversation about metaphysics that we can have later. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I would agree. I think it's a balance, right? I think you are presented with situations that are lucky at the time, but knowing, like, so the only reason I ended up working with the National Law Center, which was exactly what I wanted to do out of law school, was because I had a, I had the executive director was my professor in law school. I had had him through multiple semesters. He had never once mentioned the fact that he ran this national law center. And one day he decided to bring his program director to class to guest lecture on what she was doing in Mexico and training judges. And that was exactly what I wanted to do. And I almost didn't go that day. So like, <laughs> and then I stalked her and I went and got a job because that's what I wanted to do. And I found the opportunity, but. I think it's a it's a balance, right? Because that he he could have not decided to bring her, and I could have not decided, decided not to, to go that class. day, and I don't know that I ever would have found that job and been in this job. But we could go down that like rabbit hole forever. So I think it's I think you it's a balance of there's probably a lot of luck involved, but then if you know deep down what it is that you're looking for, those can turn into opportunities pretty quickly. Yep. 
like that? I definitely think it's also a combination of both. I think, um, you know, you need to be prepared in case an opportunity comes knocking because you don't want opportunity to knock and not be prepared. But also I think it's really important to acknowledge like the own privilege that I come from. Like I come from generations of business owners. So kind of like how Liz said, it, it wasn't really a question of whether or not I was going to start a business. I grew up having all of this business acumen just watching my parents who were both business owners. And a lot of people don't have that opportunity, right? So, so I understand that, you know, there's the whole mentality of pulling yourself up from your bootstraps, but the reality is there are people that don't have shoes. So I think it's really important for those of us who have, you know, accomplished what we've accomplished in, in this time to really pay it back and to, you know, reach out to people to mentor. I know mentorship has been incredible in my life. Um, my first mentor was when I was 19. And to this day, I'm like, what would he do? And would he be like mad at me right now for the decisions I'm making? And so it's, it's really incredible to see just how much impact um, others have on you. And meeting him was, I was very lucky to meet him because I, from the culture that I come from, there's no such thing as mentors. Like you have aunts and uncles who have businesses and they'll give you advice, right? So there's this all of a sudden a complete stranger who wants to help me with nothing in return, complete, you know, just free advice you know, what's this person about? And that was when I discovered what mentorship is. So it's, I was very fortunate in that aspect to have a mentor come in my life who opened the floodgates for so many other mentors that I've had. Carmen, I see you have a mic now. Okay, I, <clears throat> I don't believe in luck. <laughs> I had had a lot of bad luck. All my um, first two weeks when I opened the company, I was new in town. And um, the bank I was doing business with closed me up. And um, the owner of the bank was a very uh, uh, big guy here in Tucson. And so um, I, was, I was really uh, <laughs> in a very critical position. I find luck with mentors. The, um, this lady who uh, was appointed as a governor of the Federal Reserve Board, Dr. Martha Seeger, who lived here in Tucson, she came on my board and she kind of saved my butt. <laughs> so that I believe that very strongly that you gotta be focused on what you want. If luck comes in, that's great. But as far as I'm concerned, luck does not exist but I'm very grateful when it comes. <laughs> Perfect, yes, I love that everyone mentioned mentoring and preparing for those moments to take advantage of the opportunities. Perfect. Uh, we have an online question. My great friend Julie back here is going to read that question for us. So we have a question from Brian. He says, what resources would you point aspiring women entrepreneurs to for mentoring networking, et cetera, is our ecosystem missing anything? Liz, I'm gonna- I was gonna <laughs> say to you first. <laughs> I know what I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, uh, well, Startup Tucson, obviously you guys can come and see us. Um, and we have a ton of different types of programs for early, um, early stage entrepreneurs that are trying to launch um, and as you grow your business. And I say it's the Brian that I think it is at Arizona Forge. Arizona Forge also has a number of great resources, especially if you're a student. Um, there are uh, a ton of great resources that they have um, as you're building businesses on campus. Um, our ecosystem right now is, uh, I think, a little early in some of our um, access to financing, especially for women and uh, BIPOC um, entrepreneurs. Uh, there's been some progress made definitely in the last few years, um, but it's still uh, an issue that we're definitely working on, um, bringing new types of capital forward to that point around, you know, if you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps, but if you don't have shoes, there's a lot of people um, as they launch businesses that don't have access to, um, they can't use their savings. There's not, you know, friends and family that they can turn to that can give them that first easy 10 grand that, you know, others take advantage of that you would need to start your business. So I think that's a space that Tucson is working on. Um, it's definitely more present now in the minds of people that are trying to create new opportunities for those groups. And I think that um, there's lots of really amazing, like Community Investment Corporation is doing a lot of really great stuff. 
there's a uh, BIPOC loan fund now, there's zero interest Kiva loans, there's all sorts of new tools that are being created um, that were not here even three years ago. Um, so I think we're getting there, but that's definitely still a gap that we have here. Bonnie, is that, do you have anything to add? Or? I was going to start up Tucson when I was in college, so <laughs> yeah. Go. This is like eight or nine years yes. ago. And, and, a uh, while, we've known each other a yeah. while. <laughs> <laughs> and I was also really lucky that um, just being an Eller, it, it's so funny because I, I look back and it was just so strict and so rigid and like you, anyone who's gone through, through that experience, who's been a student at Eller, you know how tough it can be. But when I had the opportunity to fly to New York to pitch my business to investors in New York City, and I had two exams that day, I spoke to my econ professor and I spoke to my finance professor and they were like, get out of here, like get on a plane, go, we'll handle like whatever, you can take your exam at another time. And I remember just how incredible it felt to be supported and I didn't an anticipate that, right? I was like, I'm gonna miss my opportunity because I have these exams. They were so understanding. It was incredible. And one of them even um, said, you know, if you still want the, the information to be fresh in your head, just take the exam proctored in New York. And so I actually took an exam in New York City in like, I rented an apartment for that week. And then it was where like, you have the person watching you do the exam and they're like, okay, show me everything. And you're showing the computer. You're like, okay, there's nothing here. And I remember I was like, this is awesome that they let me do this. So I, I'm so grateful to the mentors that I had in my professors who they knew, you know, not everyone wants to go work a corporate job. If you're crazy enough and you want to start a business, I'll support your craziness. <laughs> so it's, it's awesome that you have that available at the U of A. Okay. Awesome. Well, and I know we also have our Wildcat Mentor Society, which um, Brian, who I believe asked the question, <laughs> is a part of. Uh, so you have Brian as a mentor and maybe some of these ladies. I can get them to be mentors as well. And we have our Bear Down Network, where you can also find others in the Wildcat community willing to help and give back um, and support you. So. I think we are at time. So ladies, thank you so much for your contributions, for your expertise and sharing that. And thank you to our uh, in-person and online panel, our online audience, sorry. Uh, this has been fantastic, but we're not done because this is an afternoon with Wildcat Women. So we are going to take a short break. Um, we do have these books here that are recommendations, again, from our panelists. So you can purchase those from our bookstore, for our online uh, participants, we will actually email you this book list as well. And don't forget, if you're not part of the, the Bear Down Network, please sign up, be part of our online community of Wildcat, Wildcat friends, um, students, alumni, faculty, staff can be a part of that group. Um, and we encourage everyone to be a member on it. So thank you again, and we'll take a short break.